Okay, so in part one we discussed um, Sam Shamoon's polemic against the uh, prophecy in Surah Arum, and we showed when it was revealed and what the actual meaning was, and that it was fulfilled. But in his article, Shamoon also appealed uncritically to a variant reading, and it just so happens that uh, in recent days, uh, the variant readings of the Quran have invited a lot of charlatans uh, with their criticisms, not really understanding what the variant readings are and uh, how Muslims have always known about them and never uh, considered them a problem. Well, there is a variant reading in Surah Al-Rum as well. All right. We know that the traditional reading is in verse 2, Ghulibat, uh, and then in verse 3 is Sa Yaglibuna. In other words, the Romans have been defeated, but then they will be victorious. The variant, on the other hand, reads Ghalabat. In other words, the Romans will be victorious, or the Romans have been victorious, and then it says Sa Yuglabuna, which means that they will be defeated. And presumably this means that they will be defeated by the Muslims in a few years. And it still says three to nine years as the other reading. The only thing that's different is the words Ghulibat uh, has been replaced by Khalabat and then Sayyaglibuna has been replaced by Sayyuglabuna. So the meanings have been reversed essentially. And obviously the the ignorant Christians will be will see this and say, aha, the, Christ, the Quran has been corrupted. Well, no. Even if we accept the variant reading, it still came true. That's the other thing, uh, which we'll see. We're going to look at it from two two perspectives. First of all, is the variant reading even authentic? And secondly, if it was authentic, did it come true? The answer to the second question is yes, it did, as we'll see. Now, Shamoon said, a Muslim cannot confidently tell us what the true reading of the text is, and hence cannot ensure typo, us, that this verse originally predicted the Byzantine victory over the Persians. <laughs> well, here's the reality. Yes, we can, Shumun. We can figure it out. We know when the verses was, were revealed. It was, they were revealed in Mecca in the mid-610s, around 614, 615 CE after the Persian victories in the Levant in Syria, um, when the Byzantine armies were suffering loss after loss. And the reason for this is that the variant reading is simply not the authentic reading and has been rejected by scholars as an anomalous or a shad recitation. So this is from Ahmad Ali Al-Imam's book, Variant Readings of the Qur'an, A Critical Study of Their Historical and Linguistic Origins. He states in this book, According to Ibn al-Salah, and later Abu Shama and Abu Ibn al-Jazari, anomalous or shad refers to a recitation that has been narrated as Qur'an without a successive transmission or at least a well-known or mashur transmission accepted by the people. All right, so when we when we were dealing with Qur'an recitations, the, the topmost rank is mutawatir. And then there's also Mashur, and then Shad comes later. So this is, a Shad recitation is not considered on the same level as Mutawatir or Mashur. Al-Imam uh, then continues, he says, Makki and Ibn al-Jazari define it as a recitation that contradicts the orthography of the copies of the Uthmanic writ or of Arabic, although its chain might be authentic. Alternatively, its chain is inauthentic, even though the recitation corresponds with the orthography and fluent Arabic. Another alternative is that it corresponds with the three conditions, but is not well known and is rejected by the people. All right. So now, um, the variant reading of Surah Al Rum fits, falls into this category. It is a an anomalous recitation, as Al Imam states. This variant is only attributed to some companions, e.g. Ali, Abu Sa'id al Qudri, Ibn Abbas, and Ibn Umar, and successors, e.g. Muawiyah, Ibn Khurra, and Al Hassan. Now, notice that he says attributed. It doesn't mean they actually recited it that way. It's merely been attributed to attributed to them. And as we'll see uh, in a minute, Abu Sa'id al Qudri probably did not actually recite the words this way. Um, the attribution to him is based on a weak hadith. 
Right? Continuing Ali Imam states, however, it is considered anomalous because the scholars rejected the only authentic recitation accepted by the people and regarded as successive is the second one, Ghulibat and Sayyag Libuna. Now, when he says that they're accepted by the people, obviously people don't just pick and choose which recitations they want. Uh, what he means is scholarly analysis has shown that this is the only authentic recitation, right? Uh, and Muslims cannot, uh, lay Muslims cannot decide for themselves which one is acceptable and which one is not. Oh, by the way, <laughs> this is where it gets uh, really fun. Remember uh, Tariq Al-Tabari we saw in part one? that uh, Shamoon tried to quote, but then didn't quote all of it. This is from volume five, which I had quoted earlier. This is the translator, C.E. Bosworth, his, his footnote. He stated regarding Surah Al-Rum, the text is usually read with the passive verb, Ghalibat Al-Rum, and then the active one, Sayyag Lebuna, and is taken to refer to some battle during the Persian invasion of the Levant, 613 to 614. But a less authoritative single reading has Ghalibat Al-Rum, have been victorious and Sayyuh Labuna, but they will be defeated, dubiously taken to refer to the initial Byzantine success against the Arab Raid Muta in the year 8 AH or 630 CE and the eventual triumph of Muslim arms in Palestine and Syria. So this will suggest that the the variant was really revealed around the time of the Battle of Muta when the Byzantine armies um, seemingly defeated the Muslim army, which was forced to retreat. And notice that he says dubious, being a secular historian, he has to obviously be skeptical. But notice that he says it's less authoritative and it's a single reading. All right, so already we can see that the variant reading is not authentic. Also, in his commentary, what does the Al-Tabari state? He says, the only correct reading for us is Ghulibat al-Rum and no other reading is acceptable, for it enjoys the authoritative consensus of the Khurra. So there you go. The variant reading Ghalabat is not authentic. Case closed. But let's talk a little further. Let's, let's just be uh, thorough here and completely destroy the Christian appeal to this variant. All right, we have a, a hadith from Jami at Tirmizi, the compilation of hadith from Imam Tirmizi, which has been graded as Hassan Gharib. And we'll talk about, I talk about Hassan al-Kharib, what that means in my article, you can see the uh, resources. All right, this is the hadith, this is from sunnah.com. Now, I've highlighted some parts here, but the gist of it is uh, narrated Atiya, Abu Sa'id narrated on the day of Badr, the Romans had a victory over the Persians, and then the verse was revealed. Um, now, in the English translation, it says, uh, Alif Lam mean the Romans have been defeated, but if you look at the Arabic, it says it uses the word Ghalabat, which means victorious. So I think this was a mistake in the translator, uh, the translation from Dar es Salaam. Also, I've highlighted here in the Arabic that it's been narrated by Atiyah, as you can see here. This is Atiyah, and then it says An Abi Sa'id, Abi, uh, Abu Sa'id. Now, you might assume that this is Abu Sa'id al Qudri. We'll see in a minute that's not the case. And also, Imam Tirmizi graded this hadith as Hassan Gharib, so right there in the Arabic. Um, but Dar es Salaam upgraded its uh, grading to Sahih. And I think the reason is because if we look at the text version, the uh, Dar es Salaam version, all right, this is from the 2007 publication, volume uh, five, you notice that the translation still says defeated. But then the Arabic has been changed to Ghalibat. All right, instead of, let's go back, Ghalibat, it is now Ghalibat. And this is why they have been graded as, as Sahih. So what this is showing is the narration from Atiyah and Abu Sa'id with Ghalibat is not reliable. And we'll see for more, reason, more reason for that later on. And then there's another hadith, this is number 2935, also related by uh, Abu Sa'id and Atiyah, and it's the same exact uh, uh, chain of transmission. If you, if you compare the chain of transmission, it includes uh, Alamash and so on and so forth, uh, and Atiyah and Abu Sa'id. It's the same exact one. This one says Ghulibat. And if you check this on sunnah.com, it also says Ghulibat.
So we have two hadith from the same chain of narration. One says ghalabat and the other one says ghalibat. So obviously there's something wrong here. Right? And this hadith was graded by Dar es as Hassan. Uh, by Imam Tirmizi, it was graded as uh, Hassan uh, Gharib. So what's going on? Well, all our problems are solved when we realize that the narrator, Atiya al-Awfi, was not reliable. He was graded as weak by the majority of scholars. All right, so this is, uh, I took this from a website uh, from Sufyan al-Thari that he heard Qalbi, Muhammad ibn Sa'id, said, Atiyah gave me a nickname, Abu Sa'id. Abu Khalid Amar also said, Qalbi said to me, Atiyah said to me, I gave you the Qunya Abu Sa'id. And I say it was narrated to me from Abu Sa'id. And here's the interesting part. Al-Khatib, the famous Hadith scholar said, he did this to delude people that the person he narrates from is Abu Sa'id al-Qudri. Remember that the, the variant reading Ghalabat has been attributed to Abu Sa'id al-Qudri. And we have a hadith that says Abu Sa'id narrated regarding the Battle of Badr. This is from Atiyah al-Awfi. Right? So he was saying that Abu Sa'id al-Qudri narrated it even though Abu Sa'id did not narrate that. It was, some, it was someone else. Uh, he was he was giving the name Abu Sa'id to uh, Qalbi and al khatib said that this was to delude people. So all the scholars, and I mentioned several ones that are also mentioned in this article here, um, regarded Atiyah as weak. He was also called a mudallis, and I define what that is in the article as well. All right, all this proves that the narration is unreliable and we don't have to follow it. All right, and then by the way, we also have another hadith in Tirmizi from the same volume, volume five. In fact, this is one of the very next hadith, number three nine three one nine three. This is graded as Hassan Sahih Gharib, so it's a little higher in grading. And this one says clearly that the verses were revealed in Mecca. If you read this, it talks about Abu Bakr uh, making a bat and so on and so forth. All right, now I'm going to throw out a possible reason why some people read it as Ghalabath. This is just my theory. It may be wrong. God knows best. But you notice that this is from Ibn Abbas, who was saying that the Romans have been defeated uh, in the nearest land. He quotes Surah Al-Rum. And then he says, this is his, his commentary, his explanation, Ghalibat wa Ghalabat, defeated and then victorious. All right? And it's also here in the Arabic. Qala uh, Ghalibat wa Ghalabat. So Ibn Abbas was saying that Romans have been defeated, but then they will be victorious later on. So maybe what happened was some people misheard this and thought that Ghalabat was the actual recitation when it was actually Ghalibat. Just a theory of mine, just throwing it out there. It may be wrong. God knows best what actually happened. But we know for a fact that the narrations from Atiyah are unreliable, and the only authentic recitation is Ghalibat, which is the traditional reading. Very briefly, the 10 authentic mutawatir recitations all recited in one way. They all say, room. Why? Why do they all say the same thing? Because the recitation is not taken from the consonantal skeleton, ya colon. It's taken through it's taken through the Sunnah. They learn this from one another. They took this from their teachers. There is not a single authentic recitation that says the Romans were victorious, even though both can be read using the consonantal skeleton. Hopefully you learn something here. <laughs>
and it could have happened as late as six thirty because that's when the um, Byzantines had defeated the Muslims at the Battle of Muta. Right? More likely, it would have been revealed around six twenty-six. So based on that, it was still fulfilled. Why? Let's see. All right. This is again my chart from the article uh, based on the timeline provided by Walter Kagi in his book. All right. We know that Heraclius began his string of victories around 622. In 624, he lost his offensive into Armenia. He destroyed uh, the cities of Devin and Takta Suleiman. He defeated the Persian general near Arkash by the end of 624. In 626, January, is when the second Badr expedition occurred, Badr II. All right, we know there was Badr one in 624, which was an actual battle. Badr II was not a battle. There was no fighting between the Muslims and the, the pagan Quraysh. They actually retreated and did not fight the Muslims. All right, this is a less well-known expedition. All right, and some of the readings state that the we saw the reading from Abu Sa'id uh, via Atiyah that it was revealed at Badr on the day of Badr. But we have we know for a fact that uh, when Abu Bakr made the bet with with Ubay uh, ibn Khalaf, Ubay had died by the time the prophecy came true. And then uh, so when Abu Bakr collected the winnings from the bet and then gave it in charity, he collected it from Ubay's inheritors because he was not alive. And we know for a fact that Ubay died not in Badr, not in the Battle of uh, Badr I. He died in the battle after the Battle of Uhud. He had been wounded during the battle and died shortly thereafter. So therefore, if the, authentic, the narrations from Abu Sa'id and Atiyah, if they were authentic, which we know they're not, they would not have been revealed. The verse would not have been revealed until Badr II because they, it mentioned the day of Badr. So it could only be the second Badr expedition. So that would be the only possible date for the revelation of that verse, 626, All right? Now, if you were to go down the list, within nine years, were the Muslims victorious or were the Byzantines? Were the Byzantines defeated? Yes. All right, uh, beginning in 634, Muslims started to defeat the Byzantine armies. All right, in 634 to 635, there were Muslim victories in Syria and Palestine. In 635, the Muslims captured Damascus. In 636, there was a major victory at Yarmouk, a very famous battle. In 636, so this is now 10 years, Jerusalem fell to the Muslims. So within the, the three to nine year period, the Muslims were victorious. So the prophecy is still authentic. But we know for a fact that it was not an authentic narration. So subhanAllah, uh, again, Shamoon shows his really bad research. The bias that he starts with, he does not look into this issue. This is a very complicated issue. This also shows how complicated uh, hadith studies can be. Right? You have to be very vigilant and very detailed when you analyze these hadith, these reports. All right, in part three, now I'm going to turn the tables. So we've already defeated and destroyed Jamun's polemic against the prophecy. We know the prophecy came true, subhanAllah. Now we're going to see a false prophecy what, what an actual false prophecy looks like. We're going to see it from Shamoon's New Testament, inshallah.